You're listening to the Dwell on These Things podcast. I'm John Stonge, and today we have a return guest. We have Andy Storch with us. He's the author of Own Your Career, Own Your Life. And you probably remember the last time we had Andy on because I, I called him a unique and special guest because Andy and I do not come from the same place regarding religious faith. Andy does not claim to have a religious faith. Obviously, you know that that I call myself a Christian. and uh, And so Andy and I are good friends, and we thought with our initial episode that it would be fun to just kind of have a conversation and show how people from different perspectives can develop a friendship and develop respect for one another. And so that that episode got a lot of feedback, Andy. I got a mm-hmm. lot of feedback from that. So did you? Oh, yeah. And I was seeing a lot of it on, on social media. And I think you know, one of the interesting things about it, and first of all, thank you so much for having me back on. Uh, I, I've been on a lot of podcasts. I never a million years thought I'd be a return guest on a religious show <laughs> by any means. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you and our friendship. And and I think the, the common theme I heard from people when they were sharing feedback or sharing it with others on social media, online with with people with me, was it was kind of this like, not like a sense of relief, but almost like it's refreshing to see that people from different backgrounds, different beliefs can be friends and can have an open conversation. And I think the undertone of that was that most of the time we can't, or I, you know, most people saying, I don't feel like I have anybody I can have this conversation with, right? I'm having it with the people around me who agree with me and believe in the same things. And I have this strong desire to have this conversation with other people who believe different things, but I don't know how to broach it because it's so scary. It's so awkward. It, it can go bad quickly, um, you know, and, or, or maybe worse, maybe you just feel like, well, I, I don't think I have anything to talk about with some of those other people. And, right. and one of the things you and I talked about in preparing for this was dispelling that myth, right? That if you don't believe in the same things as someone else, then you can't be friends, right? And we joked that that's true for sports, politics, <laughs> religion, whatever it may be, right? This is true. Yeah. And a lot of people come from that perspective where they think that that basically the only people that they can develop friendships with over the course of their life are people that basically believe the exact same things that they believe. Now, I, I'm pretty firm in my beliefs, but one of the things that that my beliefs teach me is that I'm supposed to teach that I'm supposed to treat people with respect. Mm. And I don't believe I'm living out Christian faith if I'm not treating other people with respect, regardless of whether they agree with me or disagree with me. So I actually believe that that's a tenet of the Christian faith if we're supposed to be, if we're living it out. So that's in the back of my mind, even when we engage in conversations, even if we disagree about something, that's still in the back of my mind, because I, I really believe that that's a core belief of a maturing Christian. I wish it was a tenet of humanity that we treat, we treat each other with respect, right? Regardless of who you are, where you come from. And something I think about a lot is, and this can, sports is an easy example of this, is like the beliefs that you have are heavily influenced by your upbringing, like where you grew up, your parents, the people around you, right? Like you're not, you don't sure. magically wake up. I mean, everybody has different stories, right? But if you know you you grew up in a family and, and ended up being around people who were members of the Christian church and and you you know went that way right but if you had been born in China or India or somewhere else or like other religions were dominant or prominent you might be believing in something else and it's the same thing with sports right like you're an Eagles fan why because you grew up in Philadelphia or in in Pennsylvania right like it, it it's a lot harder for you to end up being a Seahawks fan or something else, like we're influenced. Like I'm a, I'm not a big professional football fan, but college football, I'm a diehard Gator fan, University of Florida, because my dad went to school there and I went to school there. And the only reason I wanted to go to school there was because my dad went to school there. I was heavily influenced by him and by my parents in many different ways. And I think a lot of times people don't think about the fact that like how influenced they are by other people, especially their parents and people around them in their lives when it comes to religion, politics, sports, um, you know, just kind of their outlook on the world. Obviously, we can all learn, grow and change. And, and many of us do. Uh, but first and foremost, like we we don't we're not born with these beliefs, right? We're influenced by people. This is true. Our, our family, our context has a huge influence on what we're introduced to, what we're exposed to. 
and um, and what's modeled for us without without a doubt. And uh, I made Andy laugh a little bit before we started the recording here today because I said, Andy, my vision for today's show, because he and I were trying to decide what do we want to talk about today that could be a good continuation of our conversation from last time where we, we were just asking each other, open questions about our core beliefs. Why do you believe what you believe? What do you believe? Things of that nature. And then just responding respectfully and having a conversation like that. So I suggested to Andy that today be the Dwell on These Things Christmas special featuring John Stonge and my good friend, my non-religious friend, Andy (laughs) Storch. So Andy, did you ever think that you would be invited to be a co-host on a Christmas special <laughs> on, I, on, a, on a religious podcast. I already know your answer, but. <laughs> yeah, never in a million years. And I'll tell you why, for two reasons. One, I'm obviously, I'm not a Christian. Um, I don't, I, while I do celebrate Christmas, I don't celebrate, you know, recognize it as Jesus's birthday or anything like that, right? Um, but the second reason I would say is that I'm not like a big Christmas guy. I'm putting air quotes up. <laughs> you know, we have a tree and we give presents, but we don't like do a big, big thing like I know a lot of families do. So I, well, I don't. Well, let's say, start you know, off with that. Like, give us give us a picture of what Christmas looks like in the Andy Storch household. Uh, well, you know, uh, I would say first of all, you know, growing up, we always had a tree and presents, and Santa came, and and maybe we put some lights up or something like that. Uh, that, that was that was kind of it. You know, we and we would have family get together on Christmas, and now it, it's pretty much the same. You know, we we have a Christmas tree up in our house, and uh, I've put some lights up on the on the house and on the tree a little bit, and we exchange gifts, and we also get together with family uh, on my mom's side of the family, at least. My mom will have, host a Christmas dinner, uh, you know, small gathering, uh, just as we did for Thanksgiving. It's kind of like the, you know, I see it as like Thanksgiving part two. I don't know, you know, <laughs> another way to look at it, but it's like, it's it's a good reason to get family together to talk and and exchange gifts and and have a good time. And and that's kind of been the the focus of that for you. And, and so what do you, what would you think, um, would you say there's any greater purpose to Christmas for your family? Or would you just say, this is an opportunity for us to have fellowship and friendship as a family and, and carve out dedicated time for each other. Yeah, I, I don't think for us, there's any greater purpose than that. It's just the the tradition of this is the time to get together. And, and like you said, share fellowship and exchange gifts and, and be happy. Um, similar to Thanksgiving, I, I think Thanksgiving is tends to be my favorite holiday Mm -hmm. uh, because it does bring everybody together. And I'm very big on gratitude. And I think it reminds a lot of people to be thankful for what they have. Um, And so I see it as similar to that. I I don't really think about a a bigger purpose for it. What about you? So my Christmas traditions are strange. All right. I'm just going to admit that. (laughs) I'm going (laughs) to admit that right off the bat, because it sounds like from an external standpoint, you do more for Christmas than I do. (laughs) <laughs> which which might seem strange, right? That's 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 crazy because I don't do that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so years ago, I decided that uh, this would be maybe around 2010. I, I talked this over with my wife and and with our family, and we decided that we really wanted to simplify what Christmas looked like in our household. And so we, we simplified it to a, a pretty high degree. We just kind of decided every year, uh, let, let's just sit down and talk and, and decide what we want to do this year. So do we want to put up a tree? Do we want to uh, do something particular with gifts? Do we want to travel somewhere and do something? And uh, basically what we, what it ended up becoming, so my house is not decorated for Christmas, which probably shocks you. And I don't have a Christmas tree. Does that oh, surprise you? That does surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I took a, a vote with my family. So I'm, I'm not so I'm very big into Jesus, right? And I'm very and by big. By the way, into- let me just interrupt for a second there because I, I, I don't. I'm of limited understanding of like the actual history and reason behind all of this, right? But I'm guessing a tree has nothing to do with you know the original meaning of Christmas Correct. and Jesus. And, and I'm almost thinking when you say you don't have a tree, I wouldn't. If I were going to judge or criticize you, I wouldn't say, "Oh, you're not a very good Christian." I would call you un-American. <laughs> 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 so you're questioning my patriotism. That's is what, right. Is exactly. Okay. Yeah. No, so, tell me more. Yeah. So uh, we just over time decided we're just not highly into some of the fanfare that goes with it and some of mm. the added stress. And I think part of it was, uh, you know, there are a decent amount of people in my life that really go overboard for Christmas and it kind of adds 
a little bit of stress to my life if I'm not, sure, if, sure. you know, if I'm uh, if I'm honest. And in my role as a pastor throughout the years, one of the things I've noticed is that there are some people that celebrate Christmas joyfully and some people that celebrate Christmas stressfully. And a lot of that lands on my desk one way or another. Mm. And somewhere along the way, it created within me a desire to just really have a very simple celebration as a mm. family. And so we start off our day, we read from Luke chapter two in the Bible. And uh, we talk about the birth of Christ. We have a, a lovely breakfast together. We open up some gifts together. Uh, we have some Christmas movies that we'll sit down and watch together and usually have a board game. Uh, we decided that we don't want to do any travel on Christmas anymore, but then we go and we visit family after Christmas. And so the week after Christmas, we spend some time visiting my side of the family and then my wife's side of the family. And that seemed to be the right blend for us. Although I got to tell you something that I decided to do this year that's totally different from everything yeah. I just described. Or not totally different, just partially different. My youngest daughter is the one person who seems to wish that we did Christmas big. And mm -hmm. I feel bad that every year she gets voted out. So I decided that this year we're not voting. And I, I gave her complete authority over anything we do for Christmas, as long as it doesn't damage the house. That was what I said. It just can't, <laughs> it cannot damage the house. You gave her and a so budget as well, right? I did. I gave her 100% of our Christmas budget. I She's 15. Actually, she just turned 16. But when I gave it to her, she was in the last couple of weeks of being 15. Mm. And so I gave 100% of our Christmas budget to her. And I said, you're in charge of decorations. You're in charge of gifts. And no one can outvote you this year. This year, you are 100% in charge of Christmas. Wow. And so it's kind of fun to see what she's doing with it. I felt bad that she was getting outvoted, the, the rest of us. So there's six of us, my wife and I, and we have four kids. And it was always five to one. The vote was always five to one. All of us wow. would vote for really simple. And Julia wanted something that was a little bit more She wants to be in a family. What's that? <laughs> she wants to go to another family. Yeah, maybe. Has real I don't blame her. I don't blame her. But this year, this year, I, she's in charge of it. So I don't hmm. know how this story ends. I'll have to tell you that after Christmas. But Julia is in charge of our Christmas. Do, do you guys year. normally, I, I don't remember if you said this, do you normally exchange gifts on Christmas as well? Or are you just kind we of- We do. Yeah, we, yeah, we, okay. we buy some gifts for the kids and, and yeah. uh, do that. And, um, and that's about it. But we did, don't expect- Did Santa Claus to get come when they were younger? No, we didn't do Santa. Huh. We did not. Although here's here's a funny thing about that. Uh, my father looks like Santa Claus, like straight up looks like Santa on purpose. Like okay. I mean, he he has the long white beard and everything. And at Christmas time, he plays Santa. So yeah. he goes around and he plays Santa at different places and and mm -hmm. uh, all that. And that's only recent. He only just started doing that a few years ago. Okay. And uh, but no, we didn't we didn't tell the kids uh, you know that there was a Santa or do anything like that. Can, I, can I wonder you share what my more? list. Like, why why what? why not? Why why did you do that? And with that being a conscious decision, my because I we discussed this as well when my kids were younger. Uh, you know, the, the follow up or challenge would be if they go to school. Like, how do you account for the fact that they have conversations with other kids and and that sort of thing? Well, we, we were very clear with them. Don't ruin this for anybody else. You know, this is something that, that we're just straight up with you about here in the household. But our concern, and I don't know that this is a big concern. So it, first of all, I, I'll give a few caveats to this. If somebody listening disagrees with what I'm saying here, I, I totally understand there's multiple perspectives on this. This was just a preference. The whole point of this conversation, right, is like we share our perspectives and opinions yeah. and other people can live their life how they want to live their life. Right? Yeah. And, and so... Um, my wife and I decided, you know, we wanted, so a big part of our household is asking our children to believe in someone they cannot see. Mm, right. And so true. we're, we're focused on Christ in that regard. And, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time explaining to them how, okay, we were, we were playing make believe in one area, but this other area is real. And yeah. so, so for us, we're like, no, nah, let's just, let's just admit that this is, that this is just for fun you know, the Santa thing. And, um, but I will tell you this, like, like I said, my father, now he plays Santa. Santa's in high demand this year. There's not as many people willing to play him. And, um, and we have a, a, a Christmas dinner coming up at our church in just a few days. And my father will be there as Santa. He lives a couple hours away, but I invited him to, to come down and, and uh, let kids get their picture taken with Santa and stuff like that. So there are families in our church that do the Santa thing, some families that don't. And, um, you know, we make no judgment about that whatsoever. It's just sure. that our, our preference was to, um, you know, to not, 
And, um, but it was, it's strange, you know, when you said, all right, your house isn't decorated, you don't have a tree, like, does it, how, you know, I'm sure that there are people in your life that, that wonder, how, how could you even be a Christian or, or whatever? Right. And I remember when we first moved to our neighborhood here in 2008, and our neighbors noticed, first of all, they, they wondered what it was going to be like when a pastor moved in next door. Right. People were highly curious about that. And I, I thought, I wonder what they think. Like, what kind of stereotype do they have going on in their they, mind? They think he's going to be doing all kinds of Christmassy stuff. Meanwhile, he's out there <laughs> making videos about lawn care. Yeah, that's exactly what I, when I didn't decorate my house and when people came over and they're like, hey, we thought you did Christmas small, but we didn't know you didn't do it at all. And I was like, no, no, we, we do that. And then my one neighbor said to me, she said, I don't understand how you as a pastor don't have any Christmas decorations on your house. I was like, Christmas decorations have nothing to do with right. my religious it's faith. So it's just a, it's a, a tradition, but, and yeah. I, you know, I, I think plenty of people do it really nice. It's just not our thing, but nobody understands that nobody, like m there's literally nobody in my life that seems to agree or understand maybe like one person. There was one woman yeah. in my church that at one point said to me, she said, pastor, I have to admit, that um, when I found out that you do things simply at Christmas, that gave me permission to do something that I've really wanted to do for a very long time and simplify what we do. She, she said, I, I figured if the pastor's going to take the charge and take the arrows for simplifying things like that, I'm, I'm going to jump in too and say, hey, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. <laughs> well, so I, I do have one comrade in that. I have a question for you related to that. Uh, Go for it. Of earlier, you know, the whole thing with the lights and the gifts and the shopping and all this stuff. Yeah and the music and everything, right? And, and many of us love that. And, and I like some of it. Sure. Uh, but, you know, if we really think about it, it, it is all comes from essentially the commercialization of Christmas, right? It's not the true essence of what the holiday was originally about. Um, do you get bothered by or annoyed by any of that? Like, look at all this stuff. It's such a huge distraction. People are spending billions of dollars and it has nothing to do <laughs> with the real reason that we could or should be celebrating. Most definitely, you know, in, in the sense that I think people turn this season instead of one that could be celebratory and worshipful, they turn it into a, a season that is stressful, they turn it into a season where they incur major unnecessary debt for their family. Mm. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of times, so a lot of those credit card bills start really piling up once you get a couple months past Christmas. And yeah. it's interesting as a pastor who does counseling, uh, for many married couples, many individuals, how much of my counseling is related to poor financial decisions that get made during the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's kind of interesting to see, I get to see the other side of some of these things. And so when I watch the irresponsibility taking place in some contexts, I do get frustrated with that. But I also, I don't fault anyone for being generous at Christmas time. I don't right. fault anyone for, for blessing their children. I think there's balance somewhere in here where we can say, look, this can be a really fun time where we're all celebrating something at the same time. But I don't think culturally speaking, most people are celebrating Jesus, right? So right. in my household, we're celebrating Christ. I think mm -hmm. most people are celebrating the secondary aspects of Christmas celebrations, whether it be yeah. parties or gifts or travel or, or, th or lights or things like that. But I also know for some people, they would look at those things and they would say, I'm giving gifts to my children. My wife and I, we give gifts to our children. I'm giving gifts to my children because I recognize the gift of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I do this in recognition. I know a lot of Christians, the gift giving that they do, they do so with an understanding that, that they're doing this because they're grateful for the gift of Christ in their life. And so I do see some people really take a worshipful perspective on that. But culturally speaking, I don't really think most people are doing that. No, no, most people are just, are, they're, they're celebrating the commercial side of things. It reminds me uh, of a couple of things. One, it's funny, I'm, I'm guessing based on a Facebook post I saw of yours a while back, you haven't done a lot of international travel. I could be wrong uh, about that. But I, um, my wife and I were traveling in Japan one year in December, and I love Japan. It's my favorite, one of my, if not my favorite countries uh, to visit. And uh, there was Christmas stuff in all of the stores and they were playing Christmas music. And I was looking around, I was like, this is so cool. And I bet 95% of people here have no idea what this is even about. Like what, right. what Christian is about, because there are very few Christians in that country, right? As background, it's a traditionally a Buddhist mm -hmm. and somewhat non-religious country. Um, but the 
the essence of Christmas as the commercial side of things, as many things in the United States has expanded and, and gone all over the world. And so they're like, hey, this looks fun. Like we want to celebrate this too. And, and so that happens. Um, the other thing I was thinking of too, uh, was you mentioned the, uh, you know, people spending way too much than they, they probably should or could around the holidays. I think that probably happens a lot. We, we've probably done that too. Um, I don't know if you're a fan of Saturday Night Live SNL, uh, but they did a skit, I think a couple of years ago, uh, it was a short where they made fun of the uh, the Lexus commercials that always come on the where the, where the like the, the family walks out and like the husband had given gives the wife like a new Lexus and so they the guy is like come on out and the Lexus is there with the bow on it and the the wife is like wait a minute you you bought a car without me that's a major financial decision how could you do that that's so funny because it's like I, the commercialization is just like oh yeah we should be spending all this money without like maybe you should think about what this is about. I just took on a $700 car payment for the next right. six years in right. both of our names, honey. Right, Free right. Exactly. <laughs> so the neighbor walks over. He's like, hey, you borrowed money from the other day and you just bought a Lexus? What the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. I have not seen that, but that, seem, that seems pretty funny. Yeah, but you, but you see that with everything, right? I mean, of course, totally. uh, I'm sure you could see the same for Easter, right? Is has gotten like uh, very commercialized. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think about even with Valentine's Day, which is not necessarily a religious holiday, but like how ridiculous it is that, uh, you know, if like you want to go out to dinner that night, like forget about it. Like, but if you just go out to dinner the next night, it's it's not a problem, right? With your yeah. with your wife. It's interesting. Yeah, it's it, it is interesting. And it, it, it's kind of uh, also fascinating how, you know, these holidays that that uh, start off as a celebration of something that has a religious component, something religious in nature, we turn it and... Um, sometimes it's almost like we misuse it in a way, you know, and it's, it, it, there, we have to be careful with that, I, I would say, but I'm, I'm all in favor of people having a wonderful time together with their family, but just our, our preference, we're not saying this is prescriptive for anybody else. It's just, we decided to be honest within our household and, and say, we just kind of like it a little bit more simpler than what is traditional. And yeah. when we admitted that to ourselves, we've actually enjoyed Christmas a lot more. There's a lot of things in my day-to-day -day life that I consider stressful and I thought, I don't need to add something that's stressful. I, I think it'd be better if I just kind of have a conversation with our family and see if we could figure out what works best for us. Can, can um, you give, um, if I could just ask one more question. Yeah, go for it. You sure. mentioned that uh, you see how Christmas tends to cause stress for a lot of families. I, I find it's really not do. that stressful for us. Although I have gotten some arguments with my wife over like the number of gifts we're giving our kids because I like to keep things simple as well and uh, how much we're spending and that sort of stuff. But uh, you said you like, you see this in counseling sessions. Remember you could give an example, anonymous, obviously, of something you see that, that's fairly common that maybe people could relate to and, and hopefully learn from. I, I would say, so one thing I would see is needless argumentation. So mm. when, when people are not on the same page, I've seen people really lose their cool about these things because not everybody's in sync on what's being spent. And then, so I'll give you another example of how this really impacted one family. And this was long enough ago that I think I could share this anonymously and it not be, um, you know, discernible. But the, uh, the, when, uh, when their children were little, the mother really, really wanted to stay home with them. She really wanted to be able to stay home with them. But because they had gotten themselves in so much debt mm -hmm. with things like their Christmas spending and some of the other things, she wasn't able to do so. And, um, and as a result, like it just wasn't something that, that she was able to do and she wanted to do it. And it created conflict with her and her husband because they weren't on the same page. And because they had taken on so much debt they, it just really wasn't an option for them. They had to pay off that debt. And so they, you know, they, they did what they had to do, but she was honest about it. She said, no, this is not really what I wanted. Now, not everybody wants that. And I understand that, but sure. I know she did. She wanted that. Yeah. And, um, and that was one way that, that I, I saw it having a negative impact on their life. They had plenty of stuff, but then they also had obligations that really robbed them of things that I think they would have preferred to have over the stuff. It's it's such a shame, right? And it's I see this all the time outside of Christmas, just in the working world. And you know the work I do in in the career development space, tech, talking to people about owning their career, owning their life, being intentional with things. You know, a asking that question: Would you rather have things, or would you rather live the life that you want, right? And if you truly ask children, would you rather have things, or would you have more time with your parents? And you know, some of them might say things in the moment, but at the end of the day, 
what do kids want more than anything in the world? They want time with their parents. They want love 100%. And, and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's hard. It, it, it's unfortunate to hear that story, but I'm sure many people can relate or, or learn from that. Yeah. And it's not uncommon. You know, that's one example, but it is not uncommon. That's actually very common. And it's it's unfortunate, but I see it a lot. Um, so I thought, uh, so I don't know what questions you have for me, Andy, regarding some deeper level things. Um, but I'm going to get us started here with uh, the question side of this. By the way, that was a great uh, opening discussion here about our Christmas traditions. I'm glad you were willing to to do that. And I want to read, uh, if, if time allows here, at least a couple scriptures uh, from the Old Testament that we as Christians look at and say, these are Old Testament prophecies of the birth of Christ, and these are things that that speak to us and, and things that I usually preach about during this time of year. And I'll, I'll give you my reaction to some of these things, and I'd love to hear uh, how they strike you. And if you're already familiar with them, maybe you're already familiar with them. I'm not sure. But uh, the first is from Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. And in that portion of scripture, it says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, uh, that portion of scripture, we, we as Christians look at, you know, it's, it's something written about 700 years before Christ came to earth. And this is one of the prophecies that we as Christians look at and say, all right, that is a, a prophetic sign or an indication of how the birth of Christ would come about, that he would be mm-hmm. born of a virgin. And then we see the fulfillment of that in Luke chapter one. And one of the things that, that I know for me personally uh, I don't feel like I go into issues of faith with like a blind faith. One of the things that has convinced me through the years that the Bible is accurate is fulfilled prophecy. So I look at things like this and I find a like a confirming aspect to it when I see something written a long time before it was fulfilled and then I see the fulfillment. And for me, it has a, like a bolstering effect on my faith. But I'd be curious what your thoughts or reactions to a, a scripture like that would be. Well, first I have a question. If the prophecy stated that uh, that the baby would be born from a virgin and named Emmanuel, why why do we talk about Jesus? What happened? Yeah, so the the name Jesus. So when it when it's talking about like Emmanuel, there it's talking about uh, the name like a like a title, you know, that he would be that the name that it, that people would look at this child and would say, "This is God with us," that he would be Emmanuel, God with us. And when you look at the the name of Jesus, that comes from the Hebrew Yeshua, and that means God is salvation. And so even the name of Jesus, meaning God is salvation, and then this here saying that this child that would be born of the virgin would be God with us. Um, They're like prophetic things that go hand in hand in regard to that. That's what we would believe. So you're looking for my reaction to that. Uh, You see that as confirming that Right. That, and feel free to say like whatever you want, even if you think that like I'm nuts and out to lunch. Well, <laughs> I'm just I don't curious think, like what you would think about it. No, I don't think you're I don't think you're nuts at all. I, I think that we all um, confirmation bias is something in psychology that, um, you know, we like if we believe something, we're going to look for reasons to believe that more. So I can see why you would look at that and say, yeah, they they predicted this. The Bible predicted this. It, it, and then it happened. Um, I guess I think about it and, and, and ask, well, how do we know what happened? Like, how do we know Mary was a virgin? How do we know that Jesus really was a Jesus or that, you know, that he was really the son of God? Like to me, that does, like someone predicted something and then 700 years later, a baby was born. And then several years after that, everyone said, oh, that was the son of God. And then the, the story got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then like some people got together and wrote down the New Testament of the Bible. But to me, it doesn't mean that it necessarily happened, but that's because I have the perspective that I don't think it did. And uh, and the other thing I would say too, the interesting this came to mind to me is that people predict things all the time mm-hmm. and every now and then they are accurate and many times they're not. And we don't often point to the times that they're not. We only look at the times that they were right. And uh, I learned this recently, this is so interesting. In 1867, Jules Verne wrote the book From the, Mo- From the Earth to the Moon. And he wrote that, uh, a rocket would be launched from Florida and go to the moon some years later. And that's exactly what happened. Like he predicted the future with ridiculous accuracy uh, for a man who lived you know, in the mid 19th century. Um, and I don't know how he did it, right? But like, I think sometimes people write things and predict things and sometimes they come true and many times they don't. 
Uh, and we often look to the people, you know, the times they did come true and go, oh, that, that was uh, Nostradamus or, you know, mm -hmm. for, for lack of a better word, right? So that would be my reaction. Okay, cool. All right, uh, your, your, your question. Well, um, my question is about, uh, this, this could be like dangerous, but is about what I often consider to be hypocrisy in religion. And I'm wondering what your opinion on this or, or see this is, I feel like, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Jesus embodies like the embodiment of kindness and you wish like kindness and respect. And like you believe as a Christian, you need to be treating people that way. I believe that I need to be treating people with kindness and respect. Um, and so to me, my outside perspective is that Christianity at its core is about kindness towards others, right? And yet I feel like there are so many people who proclaim themselves as so-called Christians who are living with so much fear and hate um, towards other people. And it makes me wonder, like, can they, can they even, like, do you see them as Christians? Like, or are they kind of like the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Imposters. I think, I think some are imposters. And I actually think that that hypocrisy that you as someone who's not a believer in Christ would observe among people who are claiming to be Christians, but yet not really modeling the heart of Christ. Right, right. I actually think that that's probably one of the biggest turnoffs for somebody even considering following Christ, because oh, they, yeah. will, they will look at some of the people proclaiming to be his followers and say, I don't know. I don't think I want that. <laughs> I don't, it's I don't, a huge I don't turn off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and to me, I, I look at that and I think, especially since I'm, I'm not just a, a Christian, but I'm also someone in spiritual leadership. I think, mm -hmm. all right, I have to be doubly careful that in my own personal life and in the way I lead groups of people that I'm not modeling some level of hypocrisy. I think about that a lot. And uh, there's sometimes I'll see things, whether it be in media, whether it be, uh, you know, this religious leader who cheated on his wife or this person that, that did this or this person that, that they found out that he stole money or things like that. And I, I cringe when I see those things because I know that I know deep down because so many of my friends through the years don't necessarily share my faith. I know exactly what they're going to say. We're all going to get painted with that brush. Mm -hmm. And um and, you know, I think of like some of the scandals that have happened in different uh, church contexts and, and things like that. And I think oh, yeah. you, you can you can be somebody just living the life, but you're going to you're going to, in a sense, have to answer for the bad behaviors and the poor decisions of other people who bore the name of Christ and the hypocrisy that they demonstrated. So, yeah, I think that that's something that we need to be very careful of. And in fact, uh, that's one of the things that when you look through the Gospels, so the, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was one of the things that Jesus, so we, we talked about him being kind, right, and being mm. compassionate. If you want to look at the portions of Scripture where he really got verbally tense with people and confrontational and very aggressive, it was confronting that issue where you had religious leaders during the first century who were proclaiming themselves as holier than everybody, and yet they were deceiving people, they were stealing money, they just wanted prominence, they just wanted esteem, they just wanted everybody to pat them on the back, and Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, meaning they look good on the outside, they've got a fresh coat of white paint on the outside, but on the inside he said, you're filled with dead man's bones. And mm. I look at that and I, I think, I don't want to be that kind of guy. I want to be the same guy on the outside that I am on the inside. And if I tell you that I follow Jesus, I want I want that to be genuine. In a moment where I'm being observed in public or in a moment of privacy, I want to be the same guy. So I love that question. Yeah, and you know, related to that, that whole idea of like being holier than other people, right? Being almost arrogant and looking down when again, I see from an outsider's perspective Christianity at its core about being hum, you know, humility you know, kindness, respect, that's really what, what did Jesus stand for? And yet so many people are, uh, you know, almost arrogant about their faith and like, I'm better than you because I've adopted this. And it's like, that seems antithetical to, um, you know, what, what it's really about. And I, I, you know, I, again, like just to take it back to that, hate, like the thing that I think about, I don't know why this is the image that comes to my mind all the time when I think about the hypocrisy is I just imagine so many people in the you know, 19th century going back, early 20th century, white men who are attending church on Sunday and then attacking black people and burning their houses and hanging people on on the week, you know, during the week. 
And it's like, how were they really Christians? It's an interesting question, right? Because many people, and by the way, that's obviously a small percentage of population. There's a lot of really great people out there, a lot of loving, wonderful people like you. Um, but I, I think of that and yeah, that hypocrisy is a turnoff to someone who's looking at the, the religion, you know, any, many religions, but especially Christianity from the outside. The Bible says you'll know a tree by its fruit. So if I mm -hmm. tell you that I'm a follower of Christ, but you don't see that coming out in my life, believe what I do before you believe what I say. And, uh, and if, if what I do does not line up with what I say, then that tells me I don't really believe what I'm saying. But you even use the word humility. And I even mm -hmm. think when, when we get to the, the idea of the essence of Christianity being one of humility, when you think about the Christmas season, we're celebrating a Savior who took on flesh and was born in a stable and put in a feeding trough and was visited. The first visitors that came to him were shepherds who were serving in a despised position in their, in the, not maybe not despised, but certainly a position that was looked down upon. They were just looked at as dirty shepherds. And so you see, you see our Savior born in a humble stable, being visited by people who were considered lower class in that society. And that's how our story begins. And, and yet somehow we think we get to be kings, <laughs> you know, in the yeah. sense of, of, of looking down on other people. And, um, and yet we look at how the King of Kings was born. And I yeah. think, yeah, I, I think we would take a lot of, um, I think we would have a much better testimony if we approach things from the very approach that Jesus utilized when he came to this earth. Just, just to take it back to the beginning, you know, Jesus was born that way in a manger, poor people mm -hmm. around, right? Complete humility. And now people feel like I've got to take on debt to go buy a $65,000 Lexus for my wife for Christmas. Yeah, you know, <laughs> be, because I'm worshiping Jesus, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> All right, like, I'll, I'll get it back uh, yeah, to you for your next, uh, <laughs> your next scripture, scripture or question. Yeah. All right. So next, this is another, this, I'm going to be preaching on this this Sunday. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm preaching on uh, Isaiah chapter nine. By the way, I was at an in and out burger the other day, and on the bottom of my cup, it had this scripture. So I'm going to read you the scripture from the bottom of that. my in and out cup. Um, Isaiah nine, six says this, for to us, a child is born to us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And so we as believers in Christ look at this portion of Scripture from Isaiah 9 and say, all right, this is an, another portion of Scripture showing us ahead of time who Jesus is, what people would say about him, and what he would come to this earth to ultimately accomplish, that he would, go, that he would be, that, that he would be uh, born, a son would be born, um, uh, you know, a son is given, and that ultimately the government will be on his shoulders. And so as Christians, we look at the kingdom of God as something that has present day implications. But if you ask me, what do I believe about the future? I actually believe that there will be a day when ultimately uh, Christ rules and reigns on this earth and is, uh, it, you know, is essentially the benevolent leader over the earth. And so Christians look at this portion of scripture as having kind of like a, a two-part fulfillment. One, he's going to come and he's going to do this like uh, he's going to be born as an infant among us. And then at a later time, he's going to rule and he's going to reign and the government is going to be upon his shoulders. So I'm curious what your reaction to that aspect of Christian belief would be. Uh, so that was a prediction that, that Jesus would eventually be born and come take the government on and essentially rule the, the earth or, or reign um, at the time that he did. Not that that's coming again. Is that what you're saying? It's so when Jesus was on earth, he explained how the kingdom was going to work. He said, first, it starts as an internal thing. So internally right now, the gospel is going to spread person to person to person because they were wanting him to set up basically a physical kingdom yeah. right here. He on some this really earth. strong word of mouth marketing with that campaign. <laughs> yeah. Some word of mouth marketing through the yeah. generations. And, um, and so he said, this is how it begins. And so the kingdom of God begins within you before it becomes the, the visible kingdom of God on the earth. And so we're in that person to person internal kingdom phase that Christ described. And then the next phase is when he physically returns to this earth. So that's so, what Christians believe. Yeah, Got it. So you believe that eventually Jesus will at some point return to the earth and rule the earth as king, 
essentially. My question or first thought is that Christians only make up maybe 25% of the earth's population. That's a guess. We could look that up. It, it might be a little more, it might be a little less. Uh, right. How do you rule the rest? How do you rule uh, several hundred million Muslims, uh, Hindus, that sort of thing? Do you conquer them? Do you convince them? Or do you just say that's not part of our realm? That's a whole different realm. How do you compensate or uh, think about that? That's a, that's a cool question. The I So I believe that uh, leading up to that, that there's going to be just a, a great awakening in, in a sense of people that, that have faith in Christ. I also believe so. And, and I'll try not to get too in the weeds with this, but there are a couple events that scripture describes happening prior to that, um, uh, like a season of judgment upon this earth that happens prior to the, uh, to the physical reign of Christ on this earth. And so there, you know, there would be you know, like in a sense, those that are on the other side of all of those experiences would be those that have come to faith in Christ during that particular season. So in other words, people like me who have no faith, as well as people of other religions would look at what's happening and be so amazed and convinced that they would say, okay, I need to come over to this side and, and follow Jesus now because he is the true uh, leader, Messiah, whatever you want to call it, who is our savior for the world. Yeah, I do, I do believe that that's going to happen. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, that reminds me of another question I always wonder about when when Christians are especially getting a little bit, uh, you know, arrogant about our our religion is the right one, and if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to heaven. Uh, that sort of thing. How do you account for other religions today? Someone born into uh, Islam or who is a Hindu or uh, a Jew, right? And has is never may never even be exposed to Christianity, or maybe they are, but obviously they're going to stick with their religion as you've stuck with yours. Uh, you know, what happens for them? How do you account for that with this kind of ultimate decision at the end of, of life? So that question right there is the primary motivator that causes me to create the content that I create. Hmm. So this podcast, my preaching from a pulpit, the chapter a day audio Bible, my blog, my website, all of those things, what I'm trying to do is introduce as many people as I can during my short earthly life to the message of Christ's gospel so that they would meet Jesus wherever they are. And I check my stats to see where people are listening to these things, because some of the countries that you just described it's not legal for people to own a Bible. It's not legal for people to convert to Christianity, at least mm. in a public way. And, um, and so I kind of look at what I'm doing as, a, as like a mission to get behind the walls of an oppressive culture and introduce people to the gospel, because I believe that you do have to come to faith in Christ in order to experience salvation. And I, I want to do the best I can using technology and I know another, a, a lot of Christians uh, believe this, that, you know, we can utilize technology to share the gospel with other people in the hopes that they will hear it and respond and, uh, and come to faith. Because, you know, and we're also operating from the standpoint that, that I don't deserve the salvation, the gift of salvation that I've received. This is not something that I've deserved, and, and uh, this is not something I have earned. But because I'm grateful that I've been given this gift, that I've been given the opportunity to hear the message of the gospel, which was first proclaimed in the Middle East, and it made it to Pennsylvania, and I right. finally heard it. So it made it from one culture to another and, you know, cross an ocean and, and all of that. And I think, all right, now in this generation, how do I share the gospel with other places? So this past weekend, I had the opportunity to spend the entire weekend with a whole bunch of people that were born in Guatemala. And uh, we were worshiping together, and I was speaking for their group. And and years ago, you know, people went to Guatemala sharing the gospel there. And I and I think, you know, right now I, I look at the opportunity with compassion toward others because I believe that you must believe in Jesus Christ to experience salvation. I to me that inspires not arrogance but compassion, a desire to think, all right, what can I do to help as many people as I can to hear the gospel. And uh, at the end of my life, that's how I'm going to measure whether or not I fulfilled the mission that I was given. That's part of your legacy, which is really important. You're, you're doing your part in what you believe in. Um, and I, you know, it's cool that that religion, the religion obviously has spread to Pennsylvania. And part of the reason it did 
uh, with unfortunately a lot of persecution along the way. Uh, but yeah. part of the reason the religion did was because people were seeking religious freedom. You mentioned the oppression it's earlier. True. I agree. I think we should have the freedom. And I think that's what's great about the United States, right? Is we should have the freedom to have whatever religion or faith that we believe in, as well as to have the absence of that and live our life however we want, as long as it doesn't intrude on the lives of others. Yeah, and and I would say with Christian faith, like that statement that you just made there, uh, a good part of that, it, we're in complete agreement because I don't believe you can make somebody believe anything. Yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about that last time. I don't believe in forcing people to believe anything. I My faith is genuine because it wasn't forced on me. This right. was not forced on me. Yes, there were people in my life that modeled this for me, but I was a young, I was 10 years old when I came to faith in Christ. And, um, and then I was about 15 when I really started trying to live this faith out. So it took me a few years to connect the two. And, um, and that wasn't something that anyone could have made me do. And so I don't believe in religious oppression. I believe in complete religious freedom that, that somebody should be allowed to believe whatever they want to believe, because the truth is, that's all the way it works anyway. <laughs> Everybody yeah. believes whatever they want to believe. And yeah. uh, you, you can pretend you believe something else, but it doesn't sure. mean that you actually believe it. Picture. And so I love having you know freedom of religion and freedom to just proclaim the things I believe, even if people don't see the same way, I still love the freedom to do it. Yeah, I mean, Viktor Frankl famously said in his famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, that you know that thought, that meaning, that faith, that, that's the only thing that people can't take away from us, right? Is, exactly. is what we believe inside of our heads. Um, I kind of wanted to ask you one more question. I know we're out of time, but related well, to well, what you were saying. You go about, for it. And uh, we, we're just about out of time. This is where we'll finish up though. Yeah. Um, relate, I think I asked you about this last time. So maybe it's kind of uh, addressing that again, because you were talking about the different religions and beliefs and that, you know, to get salvation, to get into heaven, whatever you may want to call it, like you have to have that absolute faith in Christ. Uh, so two people get to the pearly gates, right? At the top, one has complete faith in Christ and has been to church every Sunday of his adult life, but he's been beating his wife and treating people poorly, right? And someone else who never went to church and doesn't believe in Jesus at all, but has treated everyone around him with kindness, has been contributing money to different causes, has like done all these things to make the world a better place. Who gets in or is it just neither one? I would say probably neither one in the sense that, you know, these are two people that seem to have faith in themselves, but not faith in Christ, because mm -hmm. somebody that would be hurting his wife doesn't demonstrate that Christ lives in his heart. You know, right. you'll know a tree by its fruit. I don't, I would right. not in any way believe any man who told me that, that he um, hurts his wife, that if he tries to tell me that he loves Jesus, I'd be like, you know what, I'll believe it when I see it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and the other person who may be doing wonderful and good things has not yet connected the fact that, that they, their faith seems to be in their good works. And when you look at a, Ephesians chapter two, it talks about the fact that we won't be granted eternal life by our good works. We'll be granted eternal life by grace through faith. So it's a gift of God. And we, you know, we're talking about gifts. It's Christmas time, right? So it's a gift of God that's given to us. We open it up by faith. Mm. And, um, and anyone that the only reason, so I won't even be able to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I dedicated my online platform to you. I wrote books for you. I, right. I, I, I preached from pulpits for you. None of that is, has anything to do with me entering into heaven. The only thing I'm going to be able to say is I trust in your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price for my sin when he died on the cross and then rose from the grave. And, mm -hmm. um, that's it. That's the only, I, that, I believe that's the only thing I can claim. I, I can't come before the Lord and, and l make some sort of long list of things I did do or things I didn't do. Right. Because those are the fruit of belief, but those aren't the things that, that get you in the door. You know, well, that's he, the he, evidence that you believe. He, he supposedly knows anyway, right? And I, I, we right. talked about this last time, the importance of living life with no expectations. The world, I believe the world doesn't owe us anything. And, you know, God or Jesus, as you kind of said before, doesn't know you anything like you get there and you, you find out, but you don't go in with, with expectations. Well, this Andy Storch is always fun when we do this. I, I'm you are like such a unique friendship in, in, in the fact that you're willing to do this. And you had one more thought, go for it. Well, on that note, I thought it might be useful. I know we're out of time to like end with maybe a quick tip for people who are listening or like thinking back to the feedback we heard last time, like I want to have more of these conversations with other people, right? How can people do more of that? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? 
my, my, I need to, re, I just need to be honest about my beliefs while respecting your honesty about your beliefs and, and show that, that we value each other in the process. Like at no time in our previous conversation or in this conversation, did we attempt to argue or demean each other's beliefs? Like we no. believe different things. We already know that. Right. <laughs> and right. it is just a matter of asking each other questions that are curiosity questions. Yeah. And I think that if that can be done respectfully and, um, and, and not trying to beat somebody over the head, if they believe something different than you, you can mm. be honest about what you believe and respectful about somebody else's beliefs at the same time. You don't have to pretend that you agree. Like, I don't feel like you pretend that you agree with what I'm saying. And I don't feel right. like I have to pretend that I agree with, with uh, some of your beliefs, but there right. are overlap. I mean, there is overlap. There are Funny. things that we both believe and, and there's, and uh, you know, I, I know one of the things I believe is just, you know, you're, I'm grateful for our friendship and I'm grateful that you're willing to, to be open and honest to have these conversations. Cause I don't see enough of this. And so yeah. I, I think it's a, a real blessing and a real privilege that we get to have these conversations. And the, the two of us have agreed to have the conversation in a public forum. Yes. We're letting other people in on it. So yes. I think yes. that's fun yes. too. Yes. I, I agree completely. I was just going to say uh, curiosity and humility, you know, that, that belief that you are not better than anybody else, that your beliefs are not better than anybody else. And then curiosity. Yeah, we all have curiosity, but seriously, checking yourself and replacing assumptions with curiosity. When you assume something about someone, right? That's when problems get caused. Instead of that, just asking a question, what do you believe? What do you think about this? And, and, and let them, and then say, oh, that's interesting. I believe this, you know, and then have a conversation about it, which is all we're trying to do. So thank you again for having me on to have this public conversation. I do appreciate it, John. This is this fun. Is a, a pleasure. And I love how you summarize that curiosity and humility, replace your assumptions with curiosity questions and you might actually get to know somebody. <laughs> I 100%. love it. All right. My guest today was Andy Storch. You can find Andy Storch. Andy, tell them where they could find you. Uh, well, I have a book called Own Your Career, Own Your Life. It's not religious, but it will help you, you know, lead a better career in life. It's available on Amazon. And I'm active on all the social media channels, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. You can find me under Andy Storch. And I have some of my own podcasts as well about career, talent development, and even a new one I launched recently about NFTs. All right. All right. So you heard it there. So check out what Andy's got going on. And you could find our other podcasts here for what I'm doing at desirejesus.com. We'd invite you over there as well. Andy, thanks again for being with us today. Thank you.